Basil II the Bulgar Slayer ruled the Byzantine world for nearly 50 years, becoming one of the greatest rulers of the Middle Ages, presiding over dazzling victories in both East and West, cultivating prosperity and overseeing an intellectual revival. Basil II's reign is widely considered to be Byzantium's zenith. Yet, we are equipped with sufficient evidence so that we can see Basil's all-too-human faults. More interestingly still, we also know that while he would go on to achieve greatness and legendary status, it was only after he had been on the throne over a decade when he fully established himself as ruler of the state, and he also had to experience a good number of failures before he really figured things out. Ultimately, these early failures and frustrations would forge him into the model soldier emperor who would immortalize himself as Byzantium's most beloved and feared monarch. This video focuses on the first 13 years of Basil's reign, beginning with his apprenticeship in government under his great uncle, his struggles to overcome two formidable generals who desired his throne, and the beginnings of Basil's long-standing blood feud with Samuel's resurgent Bulgarian Empire. Only after the travails and tribulations of his early reign would Basil II emerge as a still youthful version of the gray-bearded legend so well known to all students of Byzantine history. Born in 958, Basil was the son of the future Emperor Romanus II and his wife Theophano, a common woman from the Peloponnese whose beauty had won her the heart of the emperor-to-be. At the time of Basil's birth, his grandfather, Constantine VII, one of the greatest scholars in Byzantine history, was still alive. Most likely, Romanus decided to name his firstborn son Basil as an attempt to win his father's favor. His father had not been entirely pleased with Romanus's choice of a common woman for a wife, and he had explicitly written about how emperors should marry very carefully. One way to help men that fence between father and son would be to honor the memory of the dynasty's founder, Basil I, the Macedonian, someone whom Constantine VII had devoted a great deal of time and effort to rehabilitating through a biography. So Basil II most likely was given his name in order for Romanus II to impress his dad. A year later, Constantine VII died, and now Romanus became emperor in his own right. Basil, for his part, would now be joined by two younger siblings. His brother Constantine was born in 960, and they, throughout their entire lives, would work together. We don't know exactly how close they were. Supposedly, they were very different temperamentally, but they do seem to have enjoyed at least a functional relationship. And for the most part, they did work together smoothly as a team. While Basil will be the official emperor from 976 on, Constantine will also technically be co-emperor and will be doing some things on the side which are probably a little more important than they appear at first blush. But we'll come back to that when we talk about Constantine VIII as sole emperor. At any rate, they got along just fine. There was no fighting between them so far as we can tell. The youngest sibling was Anna Porphyrogenita, who was born in 963, just a few days prior to Romanus II's untimely death while still in his early 20s. The untimely death of Romanus left the three children in a pretty precarious state. Their mother, Theophano, as I've already noted, was not of noble birth, and so she did not have any kind of deep links. The idea of setting up a regency headed by this peasant empress was something which was bound to attract a good deal of negative attention from the Anatolian military aristocracy, which was becoming increasingly powerful. So it was unlikely that things would go smoothly, and there was a pretty good chance that the five-year-old Basil would not be able to assume the throne upon reaching the age of adulthood. Since I've already made videos about the reigns of both Nicephorus II Phocas and John I Zemiskis, I won't go through their reigns in any great detail here. Suffice it to say that these are the two soldiers who managed to 
put themselves on the throne in Basil's stead, ostensibly as guardians. Luckily for Basil and his siblings, however, both Phocas and Zemiskis did not have direct male heirs. The greater threat of the two of them was actually Nicephorus who came first because while he did not have sons of his own, he did have three adult nephews, all of whom were very ambitious, and he was by far the greatest threat to blocking Basil's path to power. As it turns out, however, Nicephorus was assassinated by his nephew, John Zemiskis, who also didn't have a son, and who conveniently died in 976 at only about 50 or 51 years old, at the same exact time that Basil himself had just turned 18. While Zemiskis did not have sons, and while he had made no moves to depose Basil or Constantine, it seems rather unlikely that he would have simply waited till he died and then handed over the reins of the state to Basil, or that he would have started sharing power with Basil as he began to slow down several years down the line. So his death at this time was quite convenient for Basil, and that led to some speculation that Basil's uncle, Basil Lycopinus, may have poisoned um, Zemiskis. That's relatively unfounded. Uh, Zemiskis did campaign quite a bit, and although 50 was not all that old even back then, it was still old enough that someone could keel over without it being all that suspicious. Again, think of the state of medical science. So, um, this was simply good luck for Basil II. He had been born in the purple, and apparently God was on his side and wanted him to be emperor. But it still wouldn't come together quite this neatly or easily, as we'll see. According to the biographer Michael Pacellus, Basil II was thrilled at the chance of finally getting to exercise power. However, the 18-year-old emperor quickly found that he was in over his head, so he turned to his great uncle Basil Akopinus for help. For the next nine years, Basil Akopinus would be the chief power in the state, and although it is normally portrayed as Basil Akopinus calling all the shots, there are glimpses here and there that Basil II is still relatively active, even if he is only playing a somewhat secondary role. Born around 925, Basil Lycopinus was an illegitimate son of Romanus I Lycopinus and Basil's great uncle. As a eunuch, he was not eligible for the throne, so he was no threat to the young emperor. Basil Lycopinus had a wealth of varied experience. He had been a field commander. At one point, he was considered for the command of the Cretan expedition. He also had been a senior administrator. He was first appointed by Constantine VII, who at first had had some reservations about reviving the power of members of the Lycopinus family, but had then entrusted him as a major administrator. And Lycopinus had then served as a senior guy for both Nicephorus Phocas and John Zemiskis. It is very likely also that Lycopinus was privy to the plot against Nicephorus and that Zemiskis rewarded him for essentially staying out of the way and helping to then smooth things over after Nicephorus's murder. Some of our sources also say that Zemiskis was murdered by Lycopinus because he wanted to cover up his corruption. Supposedly, when Zemiskis was coming home from his last campaign, he noticed how many estates belonged to the eunuch Basil Lycopinus, and he thought that he had become too corrupt and he needed to be removed. Most likely the story was invented and it was more or less just a case of the tropes of greed and untrustworthiness being leveled against eunuchs. At any rate, even if this had been true, Basil II is highly unlikely to have cared how Zemiskis died since it benefited him and since he also trusted his uncle to work on his behalf. Pacellus tells us that Basil II had long been close with his uncle and that the two of them had a good relationship. This makes sense because Lycopinus would have been the only real member of the family around other than Basil's younger siblings after their mother Theophano was sent to a convent. Speaking of Theophano, early on in his reign, one of the first things that Basil did was to recall her from the convent 
so that she could return to court. Although Basil was only 18 at the time of his accession in 976, most of the core components of his personality were already in place. Over time, of course, he would evolve, but for the most part, he remained pretty similar. From the outset, Basil was a fairly cold, harsh, autocratic guy without a very well-developed sense of humor. It's pretty clear that he was very serious-minded and didn't really have all that many hobbies or interests aside from ruling the empire. He was intelligent, but he had limited to no intellectual interest outside of things directly relevant to the governing of the empire. It appears that in that kind of period of tutelage that he had under Basil Akopinus, that he was never truly happy. He did indulge himself in women and wine, but he doesn't seem to have really delighted in either of those things, and supposedly when he took over the government full-time in 985, he completely eschewed women for the rest of his life. It seems that young Basil was really molded by the loneliness and sense of responsibility he had as a child. Technically, from the age of five onwards, he was one of the emperors, and he perhaps expected himself to be able to really run the show and look out for the good of the empire. This is something that he took extremely seriously, and it more or less became the be-all and end-all of his personality. It, it's also possible that he experienced some real unhappiness during this time, since his early attempt at governing had been something of a failure, so perhaps for a while he thought himself unworthy, and he tried to find some consolation in the court life, ultimately finding that was unsatisfying, so then he devoted himself to gaining the knowledge and the confidence to rule in the autocratic style that he thought was appropriate. By contrast, his brother Constantine VIII seems to have been a pretty jolly guy. He seems to have had a great deal more charisma than Basil. People seem to have liked him a good deal more. He was also much better looking. He was tall and athletic. And at one point he was described as looking very heroic in one of the battles in a later civil war. Whereas no one ever said that about Basil. They said that he could be imposing and intimidating, but no one ever described him as strikingly handsome or athletic or fearsome looking or anything like that. So there is perhaps also a little bit of sibling rivalry in the sense that Basil may have been slightly jealous of his brother for winning the genetic lottery, whereas he seems to have gotten none of his grandfather's height, his father's athleticism, or his mother's good looks, whereas his brother Constantine got all of those things. Basil Akopinus knew that the greatest potential challenge to his grandnephew's throne came from the East. After all, it had been the Eastern armies which had produced and promoted two different emperors who had served as guardian for Basil in the past, and it was unlikely that other ambitious generals would be willing to set aside this new precedent if it meant that they might have a shot at becoming emperor. There was one person in particular who was a problem at this time, Bardas Sclerus. Sclerus had been one of Zemisky's top generals and had also been his brother-in-law at one point. Accordingly, he was in a great position just by virtue of that. He was the senior general in the East. He had won a good number of victories, especially early on in Zemisky's administration, so he felt like he was owed something. In addition, Sclerus had some genuine ties to the Macedonian dynasty itself. One of the major figures in his family's history was Bardas, a younger brother of Basil I. This meant that Sclerus, in theory, not only could take the throne, but possibly pass it on to his children, conveniently knock off Basil, Constantine, and the others, and then say that the Macedonian dynasty was continuing unabated. So Sclerus was a legitimate threat. Sclerus, therefore, had to be dealt with, so he was removed as Domesticus of the East and then reassigned to be the Dukes of Mesopotamia, 
still a powerful office, but not nearly so powerful as the Domesticus. Petros, a more reliable man, was made Domesticus, and Michael Bortzis, who had held this office since the time of Nicephorus Phocas, was retained at Antioch. Lycopinus felt like this arrangement would be enough to keep Sclerus happy without giving him enough power to revolt. However, this proved to be a miscalculation, and Sclerus would soon prove himself to be a formidable and very clever opponent. For context, when Basil II assumed the full authority of the emperor, this was seen as a natural development by most people. After all, Basil had been designated as an emperor to be from the time of his birth, and this was him simply getting his birthright. He was a full-grown adult by this point, and his accession was by no means controversial. However, Sclerus, to his great credit, was able to gain a moderate number of followers when he declared himself to be Basileus, just one or two months after Zemisky's death. The fact that he was able to gather even a moderate army, just large enough to justify a revolt, is quite a testimony to his ability to persuade people to follow him and the strength of his resume as a commander. Pacellus describes Sclerus as extremely clever in carrying out his schemes, something that we will see to be true. Sclerus is actually a very good general and he's able to overperform what seems to be possible given his position. Sclerus is wealthy, he has royal blood, a successful record, and he seems to be popular with the troops. Despite the fact that he was getting long in the tooth at this point, he was probably over 60, Sclerus also seems to have been really good at inspiring his men and also in providing them with quality leadership that earned their loyalty. In recent years, Anthony Caldellus has raised the question as to what was the real purpose of Sclerus' revolt. He suggests that perhaps Sclerus was merely testing the strength of the administration in Constantinople and perhaps was looking for some kind of concessions. To me, this line of reasoning doesn't make much sense, and I think that Sclerus was a very much traditional usurper. Perhaps he believed the rumors that Lycopinus had murdered his friend, Zemiskis. Perhaps he thought that a member of the military aristocracy, someone with a proven track record, should serve as emperor. There are a number of things which could have impelled him to revolt. Also, we should keep in mind that his sudden timing, that is to say, the short amount of time between Zemisky's death and Sclerus' declaration, has to be kept in the context of Sclerus' age. At 60 or older, he was someone whom... The biological clock was ticking against. His time for leading armies and winning military glory was limited, so he needed to move quickly and secure either some massive command or some role as co-emperor in order to achieve glory before he kicked the bucket or at least grew too old to go out and command armies. Sclerus' son managed to escape Constantinople to join his father, and Sclerus' forces captured the key city of Melitene and used that as a primary operating base. Sclerus also formed an alliance by marriage with Abu Taglib and got auxiliary cavalry from this alignment. So, for me again, I just don't see the validity of the argument that this was simply a chin check on Constantinople. I think instead this was a full-fledged revolt with the explicit object of installing Sclerus as one of the emperors or even better as the emperor. Basil II was known for having a bit of a temper so perhaps Sclerus thought that the young emperor would march headlong into Asia Minor, meet with a massive defeat, and then leave Sclerus as emperor. Uh, of course things didn't work out that way but it wasn't an unreasonable assumption given uh, what ends up happening and also given Basil's early inclinations toward autocracy and also the way he ended up conducting his first ever campaign once he oust Lycopinus. It seems that Sclerus actually did have a good deal of strategic insight and knew exactly what he was doing here. <laughs> 
Early on, due to the relatively modest size of Sclerus' following, the court seems to have been fairly optimistic about their odds of dealing with Sclerus quickly and relatively efficiently. The court sent a bishop to negotiate with Sclerus, probably hoping that he would stay in his home district and then await the imperial army which would bring overwhelming force. However, Sclerus decided instead to move into Cappadocia and try to seize the important city of Caesarea. It appears that the imperial armies were also massing in Cappadocia, and so there was a probably somewhat unexpected clash in the district of Lycandus. Here, Sclerus squared off against Petrus, the Domesticus of the East, Melinus, the governor of Tarsus, and Bortses, the governor of Antioch. Sclerus managed to defeat the imperial army, after which Bortses defected to him, possibly due to the fact that with Sclerus's latest victory, Bortses was now behind enemy lines, and also perhaps because his men had gone over to Sclerus's side. It appears that most of the imperial troops who survived the battle did also join Sclerus. Now, this rebellion had gone from being a rather moderate-sized problem to a massive one. The court was duly panicked. The defeat in Cappadocia seems to have greatly shaken Lycopinus's faith in the ability of Petrus to successfully prosecute the war, so he dispatched the eunuch Leo to join Petrus and take over authority for the conduct of the conflict. The imperial army regrouped in Phrygia, and rather than seeking a decisive battle with Sclerus, they instead decided to try to weaken him by using money to bribe his men. For the most part, the strategy failed, but it did demonstrate to Sclerus the importance of continuing to win battles. The imperial court still had him massively outgunned in terms of resources, while Sclerus probably had higher quality troops at this juncture. Sclerus sent Bortses out to shadow the imperial army without engaging. At a certain point, both Bortses and Leo learned that the tribute convoy from Aleppo was moving through Phrygia toward Constantinople. This would have been a hefty payday for either side, especially the rebels. So both forces moved on this convoy, and in the ensuing battle, Leo was able to rout Bortses. Rebellions against the imperial government in Byzantium tended to be very risky enterprises, and there was very little margin for error on the part of the would-be usurper. So Sclerus was duly alarmed by this development and decided that he had to act quickly before the morale of his army completely collapsed. The imperial commander Leo followed up his victory in Phrygia by ordering a massacre of Bortzes' Armenian soldiers. This further reduced the morale and cohesion of Sclerus' ranks and men were finally beginning to desert trying to get some of the imperial largesse that were being offered to them. Sclerus therefore knew that he had to seek out a decisive battle as quickly as possible while his army was still somewhat together in order to keep his rebellion going, and that is precisely what he did. For their part, the imperial army was also feeling confident after recent developments, and so the two forces clashed at Ragiai. Sclerus was able to win the battle in decisive fashion, with Petrus being killed in action and Leo apparently being thoroughly humiliated enough that he does not appear again as a commander. Sclerus then marched to Nicaea and managed to take the city after a siege and negotiated surrender where the population was withdrawn across the Bosporus. Sclerus's son Romanus was able to take Abydus and now Sclerus was in a position to potentially invade Europe. Things were looking bleak. After Ragii, Basil Lycopinus implemented a threefold strategy to get the imperial war effort back on solid footing and finally put to bed the revolt of Bardas Sclerus. First of all, a diplomatic mission was dispatched to who buy it a law by offering to make him governor of Antioch for life if he would switch sides. This worked, and in early 978, he did switch sides, thus creating a revolt in Sclerus's rear. 
It does not seem, however, that this deal was honored for long, either that or Hubayat Allah did not live all that much longer. The other key component to the strategy was using the Imperial fleet, which was still loyal, to keep the rebels out. The Imperial fleet was able to hold the straits and prevent Sclerus' army from crossing into Europe and laying siege to Constantinople. Bardas Phokas was recalled. He had been a rebel in 970 who had tried to overthrow Zemiskis in the name of his fallen uncle Nicephorus II Phokas. The recall of Bardas Phokas seems to have been in the hope of detaching the loyalty of the soldiers in the east. If they saw that a Phokas was fighting on behalf of the throne, then this would make them want to serve under Phokas and the Macedonian dynasty. Or at least that was the hope. Bardas Phokas was not by any means the commander that either his father or uncle had been, but he did have a magic name and he also was well known as a great warrior. The name Phokas had a magical quality to it among members of the military uh, aristocracy from Anatolia, as the Phokades were the most highly regarded of these families. Later on, Pacellus will tell us that Basil II worked hard to purge the Phocades. However, this cannot have truly been accurate since as late as 1022, Basil would appoint one of Bardas' sons named Nicephorus to an office. So while later on, Basil would have to reduce the role of the Phocades, this does not mean that he eliminated the family as Pacellus seems to imply with the way that he talks about Basil's relationship with this family. Hopefully that wasn't too many spoilers, since we are getting ahead of ourselves chronologically, but I thought that I would go ahead and take that detail out now. The overall strategy of the Byzantine court was to try to pull Sclerus' troops away from the coast where they might get lucky and find ships, and instead pull them into the interior of Anatolia, where they would not be an immediate threat to the safety of Constantinople and the throne. To a certain extent, the strategy worked completely even in the early rough stages. Bardas Phokas took an army composed of mostly Western units, managed to steal a march past Sclerus, and then rendezvoused successfully with Melinus' loyal force near Caesarea and Cappadocia. Despite pulling off a fairly impressive march, however, Sclerus was in hot pursuit, and the two armies clashed at Pancalea, a city near Amorium, on June 19, 978. This battle resulted in another victory for Sclerus, and it is possible that he pursued Phocas and inflicted a couple of other minor defeats. Pancalea was not a decisive battle, but it was a fairly substantial defeat for Phocas. He was beaten to the extent that he could not winter in Byzantine territory, but rather was forced to travel to the territory of David III of Upper Tal to winter his army for 978 to 979. Speaking of David III, it is now time to take a look at him and his realm, since this was one of the more interesting neighbors of Byzantium at this time. David III was a Georgian ruler who reigned from 966 until his death in 1000. He was a member of the Kartvelian branch of the Bagratid royal family, and he was engaged in a struggle to oust the kings of Abkhazia and forge a new kingdom. He had adopted a son who was also a distant relative, and he was using his adopted son as kind of the face of his new kingdom, that being said, it was clear that David III was the real power behind the throne and the architect of this rising Kartvelian power. David had some pre-existing links to the Roman court. His court itself was a mixture of Georgians and Armenians. However, he did observe a number of Byzantine customs, as you can see from the art here where he is portrayed in Byzantine fashion. He also held a Byzantine court title. He had been making a great deal of progress in just the last few years. In 975, he had acquired a major territory, and at the time of Phocas' arrival, 
he was in the middle of another successful campaign to extend his territory. Supposedly, David was so confident in Phocas's chances of eventually crushing Sclerus and so desirous of furthering his ties with Rome, or Byzantium in this case, that he lent Bardas Phocas some 12,000 men for his 979 campaign against Sclerus. David III, if nothing else, had a talent for picking the winning side when it wasn't entirely obvious who was going to win. Not long after the start of the campaigning season on March 24th, 979, Phocas and Sclerus met in a pitched battle once again at a place called Charcianon. In this battle, Phocas and his Kartvelian allies managed to win a decisive victory, and this effectively ended Sclerus' revolt. At the site of Charcianon, there's a Georgian inscription honoring one of the soldiers who fought there and later founded a chapel. Sclerus fled east looking for help and eventually ended up living under house arrest in Baghdad with 300 of his closest followers. I won't go through the details of how he arrived at that place, but I will go into that level of detail when I do a video specifically about Bardas Sclerus. So if you're curious about that story, stay tuned to the channel and it will be out eventually. As for the men who were hardcore holdouts of Sclerus, they managed to fight on until they were offered amnesty and accepted in 980. That being said, Charcianon was effectively the end of the revolt, and it meant that Phocas had fulfilled his duty in crushing the rebellion and upholding the reign of Basil II. In theory, after the crushing of Sclerus' revolt in 979, all was well in the Byzantine world. Bardas Phocas, however, was the Mesticus of the East, which meant that someone who was probably not very reliable was the most powerful general in the Byzantine realm. This was not ideal, but there was little that the court could do about it. After all, Bardas Phocas had helped them to deal with the problem of Sclerus' revolt, and it would be ungrateful to get rid of him at this point. Not to mention that he had a great deal of support from the Byzantine military aristocracy, who would very likely not take his removal lying down. At Constantinople, Basil Akopinus was still directing affairs, and young Basil II was a young and hands-off emperor. We see here that there are some obvious echoes of the reign of Romanus II, where he had a eunuch running Constantinople, and a Phocas commanding in the east virtually on his own. However, there were also some signs which were encouraging. In the east, during this three-year civil war, there are very few, if any, opportunistic actions taken by Aleppo, the Buyids, or the Fatimids to capitalize on Byzantine distraction. This means that the various emirates are rather weak and unable to really pose a major challenge to the Byzantines on the frontier. There is a difference of policy, however. It appears that Basil Akopinus did not seem to have envisioned any grand campaigns in the east, whereas Bardas Phocas the Younger thought that he should continue his late uncle's work and further extend Byzantine holdings in the east. Part of the reason why Lacopinus was opposed to these campaigns was probably, one, the expense, but more importantly, he didn't want to give Phocas any more opportunities to empower himself and potentially use success against the Arab world as a springboard for an attempt on the throne. Meanwhile, back in Constantinople, fault lines were beginning to form between Basil II and his great uncle. Basil II was slowly beginning to gain confidence in his judgment and ability to govern the empire, and slowly but surely he was becoming more active in affairs, attending meetings with his great uncle, and also beginning to try to assert himself independently. In Bulgaria, to the northwest of the Byzantine world, developments were occurring which would go on to have a massive impact on the career of Basil II. During the time of John Zemiskis, the Byzantines had dissolved the Bulgarian Empire and annexed large portions of it, 
including the core provinces of eastern Bulgaria. However, the Byzantines had never fully established their authority in the West, and it was here that a new, Byzan that a new Bulgarian state was born under the leadership of the sons of a count named Nikola. There were four of these sons, but the youngest son, Samuel, was by far the most important. As this state began to grow and probably launch some raids, it appears that the sons of the last Tsar were either able to escape from Constantinople or else they were intentionally released with the hope that they would sow dissent and challenge Samuel and his brothers. In the event, however, the sons of the last Tsar were castrated and therefore unable to really carry on the family name, so they actually were looking to work with these new upstarts rather than against them. Of the two last sons of the Bulgarian Tsar, Boris II was killed by Bulgarian border guards because he was dressed in Byzantine garb and mistaken for an enemy. Roman, however, was able to return home and assume the throne, which he officially held for 20 years from 977 to 997. However, even though he was officially the Tsar of Bulgaria, all of the actual power lay with Samuel. Samuel was the effective ruler of Bulgaria from at least 977, and he made it official in 997 when he declared himself Tsar and the heir of the deceased Roman. Samuel of Bulgaria is without a doubt the greatest rival that Basil II ever faced, and he is also one of the most formidable men ever produced by the Bulgarian Empire. So every great figure in history needs a great rival, and Basil now had his great rival, although it would probably take him several years to figure that out. The next few years were relatively quiet. All of our sources, both Byzantine and foreign, all show Basil Akopinus as running the show in theory and in fact from 979 to 985, with increasing resistance from the young emperor. But it was clear that when you visited Constantinople and you needed to get something done, you had to approach Basil Akopinus. Bardas Phokas also no doubt had a great deal of influence, as did anyone who served as Domesticus of the East, and he was always consulted when it came to foreign policy. Bardas Phokas's main task during this time was to check the ambitions of David III of Tal, while also making sure that the shared border in Syria, where the Byzantine world connected with Aleppo, the Fatimids, and the Buyids, was secure. The real action during this time took place in Italy, the appendage of the Byzantine world. In Italy, the Holy Roman Emperor Otto II, who had been an in-law of Zemiskis, campaigned in southern Italy, ostensibly trying to drive out the Arabs, but he ended up spending more of his time on the campaign fighting against the Byzantines. Ultimately, however, when he did shift his attention to the Arabs, they were ready, and in late 982, he suffered a heavy defeat at the hands of the Arab forces there. He could not resume his campaign in South Italy because he was distracted by a Slavic revolt in the east, and he was at Rome planning the response for that when he suddenly died early the next year. After Otto II's death and his unfortunate experience in Italy, the empire's leadership was not very interested in further Italian adventures, and this meant that there was now peace in Italy, at least from the Byzantine perspective. Their holdings were safe. While the military scene of the early 980s was rather boring, the diplomatic scene was anything but. The problem of Bardas Scleris was keeping diplomats awake at night and causing embassies to shuffle back and forth between Constantinople, Baghdad, and other imperial centers. The central concern for the Byzantines was that their opponents, the Buyids, would release Bardas Scleris and his revolt would pick up where it had left off and throw their world into chaos once again. Scleris had proved himself to be a very cagey opponent and someone who was an existential threat, at least in theory. They were therefore willing to consider some pretty major concessions geographically and monetarily 
in order to secure Sclerus's person and ensure that he couldn't cause any more mischief. Also at this time, the Byzantine court, the Fatimids and the Buyids of Northern Mesopotamia, all were in agreement that none of them wanted an all out war. So this meant that diplomacy was the first and second option for all three of the major factions involved. Bardas Phokas the Younger, for his part, was not happy with this as he felt like Byzantium was in a better place than its rivals to pursue this war, and he thought that they could further extend their territory and also get everything they wanted. He also, of course, thought this was a great opportunity for him to gain personal glory, so his motives were far from selfless in this, but it's also understandable from his perspective as Domesticus of the East that he was looking for a campaign. While this was going on, Aleppo had quietly ceased paying their tribute during the time of Sclerus' revolt, and Phokas marched on Aleppo to make sure that the tribute began to flow once more. One of the key figures in these negotiations was the Buyid envoy, Ibn Shakram, who went to Constantinople, but along the way happened to meet with Phokas, the Domesticus of the East, and he quickly perceived that while the court might not want war, Phokas himself was openly advocating for war and even told the ambassador as much. Armed with this knowledge, the ambassador Ibn Shakram went to Constantinople in order to try to achieve his goal of winning territorial concessions in exchange for one Bardas Sclerus. Over the winter of 981 to 982, Ibn Shakram was in Constantinople and he met with both the Emperor Basil II and Basil Akapanis. Negotiations were going okay, but they picked up steam when Lakopinus got sick and could no longer attend the meetings. Ibn Shakram was then able to appeal directly to the young emperor's interest by pointing out that by avoiding war, he would establish the primacy of his will against that of his generals, particularly that of Bardas Phokas the Younger. He had detected that there was some friction between the court and this particular general, so he knew exactly where to drive a wedge. It's also likely that Basil II was looking for just such an opportunity as he was not a big fan of other people having their own will or having the ability to set an agenda without his permission. There was also another person at court at the time, the Byzantine diplomat Nicephorus Oranus, who agreed with his Buyid counterpart and helped persuade Basil II to cut a deal. When he recovered, Lacopinus was furious to learn that his grandnephew had gone behind his back and signed such an important diplomatic agreement. And when we look at the text of this thing, it's not hard to see why Lacopinus was so incensed. This was, on paper, an absolutely absurd deal. Uranus went to Baghdad and he offered up the revenues of Aleppo to the Buyids, along with all Muslim POWs in Byzantine territory, in exchange for the gradual release of the scleroi, the deal was finalized in 983, but never fulfilled. Of course, most likely Basil II had no intention of ever fulfilling these um, obligations since they were pretty one-sided, but it's unclear exactly why he agreed to this in the first place, unless it was just to try to get one over both on Lacopinus and against Phokas. So this is an early example of the emperor asserting himself, but it appears that as soon as he recovered from illness, Lacopinus was able to clamp down and reassert his control over the state. Basil II, however, as he would prove many times, was quite resilient and determined, and he kept pressing forward, trying to assert his will in the state. Ever since their arrival in Syria, the Fatimids had been largely quiet in the area since this was not the focus of their strength. It was merely an outlying area. However, in the early to mid 980s, they suddenly became active and relatively aggressive. The Fatimid general Bakjur managed to capture the important city of Damascus in 983 and then used that as a springboard to attack Aleppo in September, initiating a siege on the 12th. Aleppo was independent, but at this time it was a protectorate of Byzantium, 
due to a recent treaty where Phocas had forced Aleppo to resume paying tribute. Perhaps to the surprise of the Aleppans, Phocas actually arrived the day after the siege began, and he lifted the siege by scaring off the Fatimid army. He then, before departing, extracted two years' worth of tribute from the Aleppans, and then went after the Fatimid force. When he reached Bakjor's base at Holmes on October 30, 983, he captured and then burned the city to the ground. Despite his failure, Bokjor became the governor of Damascus, and he would remain in power until 988. The Fatimids, for their part, would stay quiet for over a year before resuming hostility, although once again they would meet with defeat, and after that they would be quiet for a longer period. 985 was a key turning point in Basil's career. It was in this year when he decided to dismiss his uncle Basil Akopinus from all offices and take over direct management of the state himself. A little later on, suspecting that Lacopinus was plotting against him, Basil had him arrested and confiscated all of his lands. Pacellus gives a pretty sympathetic account of Lacopinus's plight, talking about all the great services he had rendered and how heartbroken and humiliated he was by the denunciations coming from the emperor. Heartbroken and humiliated, Lacopinus died at around the age of 60, later in the year 985. At age 27, Basil II was now fully in command of the Byzantine world. From here on out, all of the actions taken by the capital will come through Basil II rather than through his chief advisor. Now that he was the sole authority in the Byzantine world, it is likely that Basil must have reached some kind of an agreement with his younger brother, Constantine VIII. In our sources, Constantine VIII is largely portrayed as someone who was simply content to hang around court, drink, womanize, and have fun. However, there is another incident that we'll get to toward the end of this video, where Constantine VIII as a man in his late 20s, was valiant, brave, and fought by his brother's side with great distinction. This means that Constantine VIII was not without energy, and surely had some interest in the conduct of government at least at one point in his life. This leads me to believe that there must have been some kind of an arrangement between the two brothers, where Basil took on certain functions of the state and left other things to his brother Constantine. My theory here, my hypothesis, I should say, since I can't really test it, is that Basil wanted full control of the administrative apparatus of the state and the military, and in exchange, Constantine could control the court, and it would be his children who would one day take over the throne, whereas Basil would remain unmarried and therefore not a threat to Constantine's children. I think this might be behind Basil's decision not to marry. Perhaps he thought this was the best way to ensure a peaceful succession to the throne going forward. In the event, of course, Constantine VIII did not have any sons. He had three daughters. But had this been the arrangement and then had Constantine VIII been lucky enough to have sons, perhaps um, it would have really been quite a good arrangement. As it stands, we don't really know the exact relationship or if there was any kind of deal, but this is why I think Basil did not marry have children, is simply because he was counting on his brother to contribute a male heir, and that of course never happened, and Basil himself never got around to it either. That being said, yeah, that's my sort of take on it. I believe also that Constantine was willing to accept such a deal because he knew that with Basil's domineering personality and unwillingness to listen to advice at times, that there was no chance of any kind of real partnership in government. Perhaps that's why he poured himself into a life of courtly pleasure, so that way he would never have to run into his brother and butt heads, something which could be both unpleasant and potentially fatal. Shortly after Basil II ousted Basil Lacopinus and began to issue orders in his own name, the emir of Aleppo, Abu al-Ma'ali, decided to cease paying tribute to the Byzantine world and entered into revolt. Shortly thereafter, Bardas Phokas, who was still the Domesticus of the East, arrived 
and he was bent on reducing Aleppo to tribute-paying status once more. First, he seized a fort to the north of Aleppo in July, and then he moved on to besiege the city of Apamea. This city would require the use of heavy equipment, so he settled down for a siege with his catapults and other machines. This gave just enough space for the emir to retaliate by attacking a monastery, killing a number of monks. Phokas then decided to retaliate in turn and inflicted reprisals against various Islamic sites until Basil II dispatched orders for him to change his conduct of the campaign, especially ordering him to break off the siege at Apamea. This was relatively unprecedented, not since the time of Nicephorus II, who was himself a superlative soldier, had an emperor given such explicit orders or intervened so directly in a campaign. For Basil II, a man of no military experience at this time, to engage in such heavy-handed behavior was an insult to the professionalism of Bardas Phokas and no doubt did not sit well with either Phokas or any of his officers. Meanwhile, the Fatimids decided to capitalize on Byzantine distraction by seizing a coastal fort at Bolanius. This would lead Basil to launch a retaliat retaliatory operation in that direction as well. At Bolanius, we get another example of Basil's high-handed method of leadership. Bardas Phokas remained in Aleppo, no doubt with detailed written instructions of what the emperor expected. Meanwhile, Basil entrusted the war against the Fatimids to the newly appointed Dukes of Antioch, Leo Melissinus. Melissinus had an initial attack on the city, which failed. At that point, he was probably settling down for a siege when Basil sent him a direct message saying that if he did not recapture the city, then he would be forced to pay for the entire expense of the campaign out of his own pocket. Although Melissinus was undoubtedly part of the military aristocracy and a wealthy man, this could still be a, an absolutely ruinous expense if it were imposed upon him, so he had a lot of incentive to succeed and he pulled it off. His second assault prevailed and the city of Bolanius was returned to the Byzantine orbit. The Fatimids, for their part, don't seem to have fought very hard to hold this new acquisition. In 976, Basil II had been an adult when he watched his great uncle reshuffle the command deck in the hope of getting rid of problematic generals. However, he repeated the same mistake and with the same lack of subtlety in 985. His priorities were one, to remove allies of Bardas Phokas from positions of power, and also to remove people who had supported his great uncle Basil Lacopinus from positions of influence as well. So he saw his enemies as twofold, the enemies within and the enemies without. As for Bardas Phokas himself, Basil gave him the office of Dukes of Antioch. This was an unmistakable demotion from the office of Domesticus of the East. To be frank, Dukes of Antioch was much more in line with Phokas's military talents than Domesticus of the East, but given Phokas's social standing and popularity with the army, this was playing with fire. The soldier poet John Geometres, who had been an admirer of the late Nicephorus II and also Basil Lacopinus, was obviously someone whom Basil II did not trust, so he was cashiered completely in the year 985. Geometres would write a couple of poems later, which show a good deal of bitterness, and while he doesn't quite directly name Basil II, it's clear who he doesn't like. The successful Catapano of Italy, Delphinus, who had defeated, or at least withstood, the attacks of Otto II, was recalled, as was Leo Melissinus, since both of them were Lacopinus guys. Both of them later allied themselves with Phokas when Phokas decided to revolt a year later. Basil knew that shuffling the deck was not enough to keep Phokas in line, so he did learn at least one lesson from 976, 
he knew that the other step was to acquire his own military glory so that way the army would think that they didn't need a high-placed Vokas general when they had an emperor of the Macedonian dynasty who was himself a great general and leader of men. Therefore, Basil decided to conduct a campaign in person against the Bulgarians. Basil II's government had been aware of Samuel's growing Bulgarian state for at least 10 years by the time that Basil decided to do something about it. Most likely, Samuel's new Bulgarian state was mostly limited to the western portions of the country, although given the relative inactivity on the part of Byzantine armies at this time, and the temporary withdrawal of some Byzantine forces to fight against Sclerus, it's likely that Samuel had made some inroads into eastern Bulgaria. We know that he had been strong enough to raid across the Danube into Thessaly and Greece in the early 980s. It appears that Basil II's expedition was an escalation of the conflict to a new level designed to deter further aggression and strike a hard blow against Samuel's incipient state, hopefully preserving the Byzantine hold on eastern Bulgaria. The campaign was directed at the functioning capital of the time, Sertica, today's Sofia. Basil II does not seem to have thought out this campaign very well. He marched in force to the city of Sertica, and he laid siege for only 20 days before it became clear the city was too strong to take by assault and was too well provisioned to fall easily to a siege. It seems quite likely that Basil had underestimated the strength of both Samuel and his new empire. Returning to the south through Trajan's Gate, Basil was taken by surprise by a well-prepared Bulgarian army in ambush on August 16, 986. This battle was a disaster bordering on a catastrophe. Basil barely escaped with his life, losing most of his men, the imperial tent, and a supply train. It was probably in the aftermath of this disaster, which effectively wiped out the Western army for a period of time, when Samuel was finally able to recapture Eastern Bulgaria and also capture the city of Larissa in Thessaly, which was one of his most prized acquisitions in terms of taking over cities in Byzantine territory. Trajan's Gate made Basil II look incompetent and weak at a key moment in his career. At this time, the military aristocracy was looking for a good excuse to revolt, and Basil had just given them one by showing that he was not really worthy of his office. John Geometres, who was still bitter about his dismissal, wrote a poem calling for Nicephorus Phocas to rise from his grave and smite the Bulgarians. This was a not-so-subtle hint that he wanted Bardas Phocas to become emperor in order to safeguard the empire. More to the point, there was a class conflict at play. The Macedonian dynasty typically tried to support the peasant class against the aristocracy. A strong aristocracy was always a threat to the monarchy, as seen in the usurpations of Romanus I, Nicephorus II, and John I. The military aristocracy, for its part, wanted to make sure that the state was not intervening in land policy too much. They felt entitled to grow their estates as big as they could because of the amount of time and effort they expended defending the state as officers in the army. On the other hand, Macedonian, or not Macedonian, but uh, common farmers needed a certain amount of land to be able to afford their arms and armor. So there was a balance that the emperors had to maintain. By and large, the Macedonian dynasty tended to side with the peasants over the aristocrats, both for military and political reasons. Whenever possible, of course, the Anatolian military aristocracy would look for an excuse to try to force the court into accepting their desired land policies because they benefited from this financially. News of this defeat was also discussed outside of the Byzantine world. It reached Baghdad. Here, Bardas Sclerus was residing after the failure to carry out the agreed-upon exchange from a few years ago. 
Sclerus entered into negotiations with the Buyids, and he was released in December of 986 on the condition that when he took over power, he would adhere to the terms of the 983 treaty, which is to say he would give over border forts and return all Muslim POWs. This was a great deal for the Buyids, who were now playing with house money. They did lend money and troops to Sclerus, but most likely their real hope was that Basil would see the weakness of his position and say, if you are willing to betray Sclerus and kill him, I will fulfill those treaty terms myself. Just spare me the trouble of dealing with Sclerus again. But, of course, this is not quite how this played out, as we'll see, and as bad as things looked right now, they were just about to get worse. Sclerus seemed determined to repeat the actions that he had undertaken 10 years before. When he reached Melitene in February of 987, he declared himself emperor and gained the support of the local governor and also made an alliance with an outside Muslim dynasty. So literally the same moves he had made before and in the same place. Basil II was alarmed by Sclerus' return so he decided to reappoint Phocas as Domesticus. However, Phocas traveled to a site familiar to him, Charcianon, and in August or September declared himself emperor at Melinus' estate at Charcianon. It would appear that both usurpers were quite taken by the symbology of their own careers. Sclerus and Phocas then decided to broker an agreement between themselves whereby Phocas would be the senior partner, but Sclerus would be included and get to govern part of the empire. Sclerus seems to have trusted Phocas and he traveled to meet with him, but Phocas betrayed him and had him imprisoned at Tyropoion. Effectively, Sclerus had gone from prison in Baghdad and then marched to a new prison in Anatolia. Not a great deal for him, but for Phocas, he had eliminated the potentially dangerous rival, and he was now the primary challenger to the throne. I've represented Phocas here with Lu Bu from Dynasty Warriors, because Lu Bu was a formidable force in a one-on-one -on -one fight, just like Bardas Phocas, although he was not necessarily a very good general beyond his ability to use a spear himself. Unlike Sclerus's revolt in 976, the 987 revolt of Phocas was much more effective in terms of getting all of the military aristocracy to go along with it. Pretty much the entire army in the east, with a handful of exceptions, defected to Phocas, so he was a rebel, but an extremely powerful one. Half of his force went to Chrysopolis and awaited ships, while Phocas himself went to Abydos and tried to besiege that city. From 987 to 989, this is where he was, trying to capture the city, but never with any success. Basil, for his part, was able to circumvent Phocas's control of the usual grain shipments by using his naval superiority to sail as far afield as Trebizond to purchase grain. So the city did not starve, although most likely prices went up or there were a few days where there might not have been grain available. Basil had managed to use his fleet to ride out this crisis, however. In 987, the major problem facing Basil was not his fleet, which was still intact and loyal, but rather a manpower issue. The Western army had been devastated by Trajan's Gate and was still rebuilding, and he also needed an army with which he could use to fight the usurper Phocas. So the only place he could turn was to diplomacy in order to get a foreign ruler to give him troops who could really help him win this war. He decided in a moment of inspiration to turn to the Kievan Rus for help. Basil sent envoys to Vladimir, the new ruler of Kiev after the death of Sevyatoslav. Sevyatoslav, for those of you who remember my video on Zemiskis, was the Rus leader who had invaded Bulgaria only to be expelled by Zemiskis and then murdered by the Pechenegs. Basil offered his sister's hand in marriage, Anna Porfirigenita, 
in exchange for Vladimir agreeing to convert to Christianity and sending along several thousand Varangian troops. For Vladimir, this was a diplomatic coup. He gained just as much from this as Basil did. Vladimir would gain international standing with his Christian neighbors and also a great deal of prestige by being the first foreign ruler to successfully net a born in the purple princess of the Macedonian dynasty, a feat which neither the Holy Roman Empire nor the Bulgarians had accomplished. Even Charlemagne was denied this honor. In return, Basil received 6,000 Varangians who arrived either in the spring or summer of 988. For both sides, this was a winning deal, and it's actually surprising that it took this long for the Byzantines to agree to marry off a born in the purple princess in exchange for some huge diplomatic favors. Basil cashed in his cards quite well on this deal, however, as he very much needed the Varangians and that group would emerge as the key component of his army for the rest of his career. So if anything, while both sides won this negotiation, Basil probably won just a little bit more. Soon after his Varangian troops arrived, Basil decided to strike the divided enemy force in Asia, utilizing his naval superiority and the mobility that it gave him. Luckily for Basil, the enemy was divided between Chrysopolis and Abydus. Basil's general Terranides in the meanwhile, this is probably the son of Asat III who had given his holdings to Nicephorus II in 968 in exchange for standing at the court for his sons, landed in Trebizond, recruited troops, and marched forthwith to the Euphrates, trying to create a disturbance in the rear of Phocas' territory. However, he was defeated by Phocas' son Nicephorus, who was able to gather aid from the Kartvelians once again. Moving on Chrysopolis, Basil was able to catch Delphinus by surprise, and when he captured the former Catapano of Italy, he had him hanged. The news of this defeat and the fate of Delphinus was enough to cause the Caucasian soldiers with Phocas serving at Abydus to go home on the grounds that they had fulfilled their obligation to serve. Once again, we have to keep in mind that the bar for success in a civil war for a legitimate emperor was much lower than that of a usurper. Usurpers had to be successful all the way until they won the whole shebang, whereas legitimate emperors could afford some setbacks and then mount a comeback. For Phocas, things were now becoming pretty dicey, whereas Basil had very much evened the odds and taken away Phocas's major advantage. However, the civil war was far from over, and Phocas still controlled more of the empire than Basil II. Phocas decided to double down on the siege at Abydus, but he was unable to capture that city. He must have been coming close because Basil mounted a relief expedition. This expedition was an all-out endeavor and included both of the emperors. Basil II and Constantine VIII attended this fight in person, and both of them were decked out in full armor. Our sources say that Constantine VIII looked especially impressive at this battle, carrying a long spear and apparently being quite graceful and skilled with that weapon. The two armies arrayed against one another, and Phocas, who was one of the foremost fighters in the empire on an individual level, despite being well into middle age by this point, tried to challenge Basil to individual combat to decide the fate of the empire. Basil declined. Phocas had been feeling ill all day, and there were some later rumors recorded in Pacellus that he may have been poisoned by a supporter of Basil. At any rate, what it sounds like based on the nausea and the tiredness that he was experiencing before going into battle and then dropping dead sounds to me more like a heart attack than anything else, but it's hard to say. At the time, people suspected poison. Phocas had not been feeling well all day, but he knew that his path to victory lay in taking out the emperor and showing his personal valor. Therefore, he was leading a charge directly against the imperial center, but 
along the way, he dropped dead, fell from his horse, and after that, his army was demoralized and easily swept away by Basil's Varangians. Bardas' son, Leo, surrendered Antioch toward the end of the year 989, and with that surrender, the Phocades were broken for a generation. As I mentioned earlier, they were not broken forever, as Basil would give one of um, Bardas Phocas' sons an appointment as late as 1022, yet this did do a great deal of standing to the Phocas family, and they would never again be nearly so powerful going forward. For whatever reason, when I picture Bardas Sclerus in my mind, Brendan Tolley, the Blackfish from Game of Thrones, comes to mind. Once Phocas was dead, Sclerus was released from prison, and then many of Phocas's former followers decided to sign up with Sclerus. For his part, Sclerus was not very active during these months, despite the claims of Pacellus, who claims that he was evading Basil and building up a following. At any rate, Sclerus' reputation was great enough that Basil was eager to settle with him rather than trying to decide things in battle, and Sclerus was then able to negotiate his surrender and retirement. By this point in his career, he was too old to really mount an effective challenge to Basil. Remember, he had just basically given up to Phocas just a few years before and agreed to be second fiddle and then traveled trustingly to visit one of Phocas's strongholds. Sclerus, for his part, though, was still sharp enough to make sure that Basil granted amnesty to all of his men. This was fairly standard, but by this point, Basil already had a well-deserved reputation for being a bit more harsh than the average emperor, so Sclerus getting this concession was pretty smart. Sclerus, by this point, was about 70. He was old and experiencing eyesight and mobility issues. Later on, when Basil sees him for the first time, he remarks that it's incredible that such an old man who can barely walk and can't see straight was given him such problems. Before Sclerus officially went into retirement in Thrace, he agreed to meet with Basil in Asia Minor and discuss imperial affairs. This discussion is perhaps the most dramatic part of Pacellus's life of Basil II. Throughout Basil's entire life, Bardas Sclerus had been a distant and imposing figure. During the reign of John Zemiskis, when Basil was a teenager, Sclerus was winning major battles. Later, when Basil himself became emperor, Sclerus was embarrassing his generals and threatening his position atop the throne. Later on, he was the boogeyman of Baghdad, and Basil had to deal with high-level negotiations with foreign powers and had to consider giving up territory in order to contain the threat of Sclerus. I imagine that he had a mental image of Sclerus which was out of keeping with the decrepit old man he ended up meeting. He told the people around him that he was amazed by just how old and worn out Sclerus was, yet one can't help but think that Basil knew that Sclerus's brain was an impressive instrument and he was very eager to pick it. However, Basil was always authoritarian in his mannerisms, and he threw a bit of a fit over protocol when he saw Sclerus wearing imperial slippers. This seems to have just been a mistake by an old man who doesn't see very well, but Basil's eyes were sharp and he saw these from a distance and refused to allow Sclerus to be admitted to his presence until this violation of protocol had been fixed. We have to keep in mind that Basil's grandfather, Constantine VII, had written at length on court protocol, and this is probably something that Basil was interested in himself, since he was always concerned with maintaining his dignity in front of others. Sclerus switched shoes, and then they met. Sclerus was apparently afraid of young Basil, because he knew that Basil had a temper, and he waited for Basil to drink from the wine container first before he took a drink to make sure it wasn't poisoned. After they'd established some familiarity and an apparently mundane conversation with one another, they then got down to brass tacks. Sclerus, of course, gave some excuses for why he revolted. Basil pretended that this was 
all fine and well and all was forgiven. And then he asked Glarus point blank, what do I need to do to successfully hold on to the Empire and prevent people like you from revolting in the future? Sclerus supposedly gave him a piece of candid and accurate advice contrary to his own class interest. He said, cut down the governors who become overproud. Let no generals on campaign have too many resources. Exhaust them with unjust exactions to keep them busied with their own affairs. Admit no woman to the imperial councils. Be accessible to no one. Share with few your most intimate plans. Pacellus implies that these thoughts had not fully occurred to Basil before this point, but I can't help but feel that this is more or less a description of what Basil was already doing, and also that this was completely in line with Basil's personality. So if Sclerus did indeed say this, then perhaps he was just trying to kiss ass and play to confirmation bias to make sure that Basil would leave him alone during his retirement years. At any rate... This was the advice that Basil followed, and whether or not Sclerus helped to solidify him in this practice, certainly uh, this was the way that Basil ran the empire from 989 forward, but I would argue probably he had been doing this from at least 985. At any rate, uh, this was how Pacellus really illuminated Basil's method of ruling, and also more or less shows us the source of the conflict between Basil and and the military aristocracy, since Basil was explicitly trying to suppress them in order to elevate himself. In early 989, at about the same time that Basil was preparing for his final showdown with Bardas Phokas the Younger, Vladimir, his good ally, decided to seize the port city of Cherson in the Crimea as insurance in case Basil once relieved of the burden of fighting usurpers, reneged on the marriage alliance. After all, the prejudice of the Byzantines toward their barbarian neighbors was well known, and had Basil managed to succeed rapidly with his Varangians and defeat the threats near him, it is unlikely that he would have gone through with the agreement. By seizing Cherson, Vladimir had collateral. And this apparently was effective, and it made sure that Basil fulfilled his obligation. Basil's sister Anna was very much opposed to this match and had nightmares about what she would encounter once she reached the land of the Rus. She was accompanied by a large number of priests who would both conduct the ceremony of marriage between herself and Vladimir and also uh, convert the population. Up to this point, Vladimir had been polygamous, and there were all kinds of rumors about his sexual depravity, so Anna thought that she was in for a very rough life. However, after his conversion, Vladimir became monogamous, and he proved to be a pretty good husband to Anna, who probably didn't live quite happily ever after, but at least was not completely miserable either. In retrospect, Vladimir's conversion was one of the key events in Russia's cultural history, and of course, since this wedding took place in the Ukraine, it was also hugely influential on Ukrainian history. There are monuments to Vladimir in both Ukraine and Russia, and even a couple in Poland as well, if I'm not mistaken. So Vladimir, through his act of becoming Christian, became a saint, and also... Uh, became a major cultural icon throughout many countries in Eastern Europe. By 989, the now 31-year-old Basil II had become the Basil II known to history rather than the inexperienced young emperor struggling to compete with more experienced men and struggling even to make his voice heard at his own court. His early career, rather than his natural disposition, may account for a good deal of his autocratic behavior and his reputation for arrogance in the sources. We also have to consider that the military aristocracy had a dominant cultural influence, and because they felt somewhat abused by his land policies, perhaps they regarded him as more arrogant than he actually was. That being said, he did see a lot of advantage in being distant. It also was influenced by the fact that he is not super charismatic uh, 
So the less direct exposure he has to people, the less likely he is to expose some of his shortcomings. Basil, I think we can safely say, was not a genius, militarily or otherwise. However, he did have a pragmatic mind, and he knew what his strengths and weaknesses were. By this point in his career, he had acquired something which would help him compensate for his lack of military genius, the Varangian Guard. This elite and loyal shock unit would enable him to get himself out of a good deal of trouble in the future, and the Varangians would feature prominently in nearly all of his subsequent victories. He was also beginning to really grasp strategy. We see that he had a good strategy against Bardas Fokas, and he did improve over time. One thing that Basil never really figured out, at least not by this point in his career, is he never really built up a reliable core of senior officers whom he trusted implicitly. He would become very close with the soldiers themselves, and he would be very generous to war orphans, but he never quite was able to really trust subordinates with a great deal of authority and autonomy due to his early experiences as a child and as a young emperor. This means that for the remaining 35 years of his reign in life, he will undertake the burden of pretty much all of his major campaigns by himself. Hopefully it's clear to everyone by this point that while Basil did go on to achieve great things, he was not necessarily someone bound to be great. He was great because he forced himself to be that. He had an indomitable will, and he ended up being more than the sum of his parts. There's no individual part of Basil II which was superlatively skilled, but he was average or above average at basically everything, and combining that with his will and his born in the purple status and the confidence that that gave him, it was enough to propel him to the ranks of the greatest rulers in all of history. Going forward, I plan to do a few more lives of men who lived at the same time as Basil before finishing up Basil's life. I want to look at Bardas Scleris, Bardas Phocas, and Basil Lacopinus. So if you want to see those videos, look at my Romans of Renown series, and those will be forthcoming within the next several weeks. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian.